Hey, this is Ryan Clancy for another edition of No Labels Talks. And this week, I have a different guest with me uh, because my typical co-host, Holly Page, decided to go off to Ireland and get married. So we're very happy for, for Holly, uh, but we're very happy to have Liz Morrison, co-executive director of No Labels, here in her stead. Hey, Liz. Hey, Ryan. Congratulations to Holly. What a great place to go and get married. We none of nobody. I didn't see this coming. Did you have any? No, I had no idea. I would have totally gone and joined in too in the yeah. festivities. All right. Well, when Holly comes back, we're gonna have to get all the details and how she covertly planned this operation. Yeah, very sneaky. Very country. sneaky. Yep. Well, she is a very sneaky person. Just people who listen to this know that. Um, on to more prosaic matters. Twenty twenty four presidential race. Obviously, uh, this week, Vice President Harris made her pick. Tim Walls, governor of Minnesota, football coach, National Guard vet, uh, teacher. Um, but of course, the the consensus seems to be that um, this is a pick that made the progressive wing in the Democratic Party very happy. Um, Liz, what do, what do you think? Yeah, that seems to be what's going on around. I don't think a lot of folks had them on their bingo cards as the sort of pick. I think everyone thought she was going to go with Governor Shapiro to really help solidify Pennsylvania. Um, it seems as though kind of both picks are playing to the base. Um, you know, J.D. Vance very much in the sort of uh, Trump base, really helping to advocate there. And it seems as though Governor Walls is really there for the Democratic base to sort of, you know, where's the middle, sort of how are they how are they sort of identifying those or advocating for those in the middle that are still maybe undecided? Well, it's interesting. We're going to get to this in a bit. The person we had on our podcast this week, Frank Luntz, pollster, uh, focus group expert, um, said, you know, wh whichever whichever candidate manages to grab the center, he thinks is going to win. And yes, it seems like to date, neither of them have much of an interest in doing that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the other thing we'll have to watch for is the DNC is two weeks away. So kind of what policies do they advocate for? He seems to be more, you know, a champion of the progressive side of the Democratic Party. So we'll have to see if they adjust in any way. But I mean, my goodness, you talk about an October surprise. We really have a sort of July, August surprise here in politics. It's every day something new. Very, very interesting. Well, I think, Liz, to that point, the only thing I feel like I'm confident in saying is that we have some more big twists and turns in this race ahead. I mean, people forget it was just a month ago after the president's disastrous debate that it was just widely believed that this election is over. Trump's going to win. And then, of course, after the attempt on his life and um, it was even more reinforcement that th this is it. Trump Trump's going to win, and then suddenly, Biden drops out. In comes Harris, and now it seems to be going in the other, other direction, right? It's it seems the consensus seems to be well. Now it's it's her race to lose. But to your point, we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple months. What's going on in the Middle East? What's going on with Ukraine and Russia? Could there be some kind of event that completely throws this? Uh, into chaos once again. I think we are also going to be faced with some, you know, budgetary issues when Congress comes back this fall and sort of whether or not that gets, um, you know, tagged to, to Vice President Harris is sort of, you know, with the administration. But it's also, it's so interesting to see the way the media has been working and the fact that probably the majority of the country had no idea who Tim Walls was and sort of within 24 hours, you'll you know everything about him or a lot about him um and sort of what that means i saw this morning i saw nate silver even put georgia now as a toss-up so i think we're going to see a lot of changes in the states that had been maybe more traditionally blue traditionally red are now going to be new new states that can be played in and what does that mean for sort of where these campaigns are traveling to yeah joe i mean georgia a couple of weeks ago was gone uh, for Democrats, according to most of the polling, and now um, it's it's back in the mix. So, um, well, look, there's there's few people to make better sense of what all this means than the person we're going to talk to here on No Labels Talk today, Frank Luntz, who we spend about an hour 
taking questions from our community. Frank almost structures it like one of his uh, typical focus groups. So um, stay tuned uh, to hear Frank's thoughts on um, what he thinks the Walls pick means, uh, what he thinks could be coming in, in terms of surprises, um, and what he thinks the key are going to be uh, in November uh, in, in terms of who, who wins. So Liz, thank you for pinch hitting this week. For Holly, you did a great job. Thanks for having me. Look forward to the next time. Um, and in the meantime, everybody stay tuned for this week's edition of No Level Talk. Hello, everybody. This is Ryan Clancy, Chief Strategist for No Labels, uh, here for another edition of No Labels Talks. And we're here with a very special guest today, uh, acclaimed uh, pollster, language expert. A lot of you uh, have known him, seen him over the years on uh, all kinds of different news outlets, uh, Frank Luntz. Frank, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to say to people, uh, we're going to go to your questions much earlier than we normally do. And I want to be responsive to what you want to know. And please, I'm warning you ahead of time. I'm going to be brutally honest. So I'm going to expect, and David, you got to put your hand down. You can't jump in that fast. So Ryan, this is like, uh, like Jeopardy. You have to wait till the question is asked before you can push your buzzer. But we're going to get to a whole lot of questions. So please stay on for the entire thing because there's this is an incredible election. This is a very special time. And this organization op, uh, is in a very particularly important space. <clears throat> so I'm glad to be on. Ryan, go ahead. Um, Frank, let's start with the news on everybody's minds. Um, yesterday, uh, Vice President Harris, of course, made her vice presidential choice. Uh, Minnesota Governor uh, Tim Walz, also a former congressman. Start with your initial thoughts on, on, on what this means and what it says about the kind of campaign she wants to run. It's both candidates chose individuals who hold their points of view. And so this is not reaching out and expanding intellectually or ideologically. This is, in essence, their vice president endorses their point of view. It's point number one. Point number two is that I thought for sure that she would choose the governor of Pennsylvania because that's the most important state of all the states that are in play. And the fact that she didn't says a lot to me. Tim Waltz is a good campaigner. He is very easy on the stump. He has a, a, a smile and a all-encompassing embrace. People like him both privately and publicly. She has chemistry with him, that's clear. But in terms of a political pick, I still wonder, if you're governor of Minnesota, you do not have an impact on any other state except Minnesota. Minnesota has been a democratic consistently a democratic state forever. So she's specifically saying, I don't want Pennsylvania. I want the governor of Minnesota. So that really shocked me. And it makes me wonder why she made that decision. And as I said, brutal honesty. Waltz is a great campaigner, but he does not bring Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is now truly up for grabs. And I'm wondering whether Josh Shapiro's faith and his public support for Israel had any impact on her decision, not just for the Pennsylvania electorate, but for the Michigan electorate, which is the largest concentration of Muslim voters in America. By the same token, Donald Trump's trashing of the pick, calling him Waltz the worst vice president ever who, that he would be. It's interesting because he's been saying that Harris is the worst vice president ever. And Trump is simply incapable without making a comment that doesn't have some sort of extreme reference as part of it. Two weeks ago, this was Donald Trump's election to lose. Today, Trump is losing it. And so I'm not critical of the Harris pick which he could have done better. 
And that's the question I would ask all of you who are participating right now to think about, not to ask me about, but to think about, why did she do this? Well, Frank, let me ask you about this, and I'm sure our listeners will have their thoughts. You, you sort of speculated, I, 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 I want to know why she did this. Why do you think she did this? Do, do you think there's some electoral angle that we're not seeing, or, or do you think it has to do with just alignment of beliefs and priorities? There is a accepted wisdom that can be summarized in three words when you're choosing a vice president, do no evil or do no wrong if you want to simplify it. And by the way, anyone who puts their hands up now, we're not going to call on. You have to get through the 10 minutes of this conversation before you ask your question. Otherwise, you're simply here just to state your point of view. So anyone who's up with their questions on Ryan, put them to the back of the list. And then and we'll say go, and you can have your hand on the trigger, just like they do in Jeopardy. If it's good enough for Alex Trebek, it's good enough for this group. I think that she wanted to ensure that there was no negative backlash and that Josh Shapiro, because he's been so vocally supportive of Israel, and this has been a split within the Democratic Party. Last night, Cory Bush, who's been openly supportive of the Palestinian cause, was defeated in the primary. It's the second person defeated who's part of the squad. And the squad is very hostile to continued of, of military exchange in the Middle East. And I want to be careful because I understand all points of view and we have to be reflective of the, of the damage that's being done there and appreciative of all casualties on all sides. But Shapiro would have caused a backlash at the Democratic Convention and in Michigan. And by choosing Governor Waltz, she has avoided that. So I think that that was a major part of her consideration. Frank, you, you did a focus group recently <clears throat> with some really fascinating findings in, in that you found some voters who were previously not disposed to vote for uh, President Biden, who said they are now open to voting for Vice President Harris. Um, what is it that has them suddenly open to voting her, given the fact that you know she was part of an administration they just a couple of weeks ago didn't seem ready to endorse again for another four years? Well, let's run through the three most likely reasons for this group of people, which is so essential. And it's why Harris has completely closed the gap with Trump, and in some polls is now leading. And I think the momentum's on her side. Number one, it was a vote against Joe Biden. It was the feeling that he was simply too old to do the job for four more years. Number two is that they never heard from him a detailed plan of action for the future, that he was just talking about the last four years and talking about why Trump is bad for democracy without putting forward where he wanted to go. And number three, Harris has been energetic what, regardless of what you think of her, when she takes the stage, when she enters a room, there's passion and there's energy and there's excitement. I'm not defending her as the choice in all of this. I neither defend nor criticize Biden, uh, sorry, Trump or Harris. It's simply what the voters have to say. And that's what this is a focus on. And the voters saw a newfound um engagement. And so if you're a younger voter and you were turned off by the 77-year-old and 80-year-old, you like the fact that Harris is more energetic. If you're African-American, you like the fact that she's talking about issues that affect you. However, if you are a union member, this is a much more difficult sale because union members who have been supporting Trump to a degree that Republicans never get, that those numbers may even have gone up since the selection, since Harris has emerged as the Democratic nominee. But make no mistake, Trump's advantage with the Republican convention after that ended is gone. It is wiped away. And if the election were held today, I actually believe that Harris would, would be Trump. That's how much things have changed over the last two weeks. Let's do one more you and I, and then let's throw it open to the group. So Frank, let me ask you, what does the path look back, path back 
look like for Trump? I, I'll just share one data point with you, and, and maybe this gets you gets you thinking. You mentioned how uh, Michigan has the most uh, Muslim Americans in the country. Well, Pennsylvania has the fifth most Jewish Americans, about half a million. Um, do, do you think Trump um, has a new opening there, given that Harris did not pick Shapiro and uh, pick somebody who at least um, early thinking is, um, is, is more um, open to the views of the left of the party as it relates to, to Israel? If she had taken it, I'm going to I'm going to answer it in a different way, and I'm not ducking it, but it's a great question. <clears throat> she could have taken Pennsylvania off the table by choosing Shapiro. She could have taken Michigan off the table by choosing Whitmer. She could have taken North Carolina off the table by choosing Cooper. She had a number of different choices of specific states that would have changed the outcome in those states and chose not to do it which is fine. Al Gore added to the Clinton ticket back in 1992 by giving Americans uh, the first uh, baby boom ticket ever. Um, and you've had presidents that have chosen vice presidents because of the theme, what they want to communicate. If this campaign is about inflation and immigration, Donald Trump wins. If it's about the attributes of the candidates, Kamala Harris wins. Trump is disliked as a person, but his administration has favorable as a favorable evaluation. Harris represents an administration that is not liked, but she has the energy and excitement that voters do want. And I don't believe Trump has the sophistication to understand this. So his goal in this process has been to demonize her. That's a mistake. It should be to talk about what's happened at the border and talk about what's happened in the economy. Her goal now is to show that Donald Trump is weird. It's the right tactic, but it's the wrong strategy. Weird is not something that people vote on. And just because Democrats have been saying it doesn't mean that the average American believes it. I think both campaigns are miscalibrated right now and are not understanding the electorate. And so this election, quite frankly, frankly, is up for grabs. And the only thing I'd say to you is that the third party candidate, Robert Kennedy Jr., has become completely irrelevant in this. And you're watching his numbers drop 12, 11, 10 percent. They're now down to 4 percent or 5 percent. And they will continue to deteriorate as everyone focuses on these two party candidates. Yeah. Um and of course, it's also the question as to whether he'll he'll be on the ballot um, in the end. I, I want to invite people to raise their hands now uh, for some questions uh, for Frank. And wow, okay, we got we got quite a few already. Frank, get ready. Um, we're going to start. If you could just say where you're from. This is Barry Miller from the state of Florida. Uh, thanks for your comments, Doctor Lutz. The question is, um, what do we do? Now, with no labels, the, the mission we have is more evident than ever based on the way you described how these two party uh, tickets have come together. The vast majority of Americans are not being represented. The issues that are most important are not being discussed. What do we do with no labels? What's our future? And your thoughts on that? Thank you. Your future is absolutely essential. And it's guaranteed as we become more partisan as we become more divided. Let me give you two statistics. Number one, 83, this is polling that we did from the National Governors Association. 83% of Americans say that this is the most divided that America has been in their lifetime, including over 90% of those uh, who are 65 and older. That's number one. And number two is that the public believes that Washington is incapable of delivering the solutions and results that they are looking for. The only way that our government works is for there to be cooperation and compromise, but compromise is a dirty word. So it has to be cooperation and collaboration that people have to work together, not just Republicans and Democrats, and not just the House and the Senate, but Congress and the White House. And nobody wants to work with each other. Everyone believes that, they're, that they have the solutions. And so No Labels is in that sweet spot 
of being able to work with everyone at all times to get things done, which is what the public prioritizes right now. The key is the Problem Solvers Caucus, and then even beyond that, how you provide a safe space where Republicans and Democrats can meet and discuss and disagree. Because in the end, that was what was so important with the governor's initiative over the last year, disagree better. And I'm going to tell you something that I've never acknowledged before, which is I've got a condo in D.C., and every week I try to bring over Republicans and Democrats. I've got a great round table and I convene these sessions and there are Democrats and Republicans, senators and congressmen, and I let them decide what they want to talk about. But in doing so, they have conversations that are not happening in the Capitol, are not happening in committee meetings, and it enables people to hear alternative points of view and then act on them. This is what No Labels do, does in an incredibly effective way. Now, make no mistake. I said this was going to be a direct conversation and with brutal honesty. I am extremely disappointed that there isn't a No Labels candidate on the ballot for the fall. But equally important, if No Labels did not exist, there would be no convening force. There would be no support political support, financial support, moral support for organizations like the Problem Solvers Caucus. So your role right now is to be the voice of reason, is to be the voice of honesty, because truth in politics is what is most needed right now. If we bring the truth back in, we can actually make a difference. But as long as we get our news to affirm us rather than inform us, we're not getting the truth. And No Labels serves that role in calls just like this. So great question. Next question. Thanks, Frank. David, where are you from? Uh, uh, I'm from Texas. Uh, so I don't think we matter. I think Georgia and Pennsylvania matter a lot, but that's not my question. My question is single issue voters. How many uh, single issue voters are there on the issue of Israel, whether it's pro-Israel or against Israel, and what states are most in play because of it? So that's a great question. Now, I can see five people across and five people down. So I got 25 people on this call. I'm not asking whether Israel is the most significant issue to you, but how many of you care about the issue of Israel in your vote? How many of you would say that it has, that it matters physically? Raise your hands. Okay, that's most of you. And that's what's exactly what's happening right now. Because it's not just about Israel or the Palestinians or Hamas or October 7th or what's happened in Gaza. It's also about the U.S. position in global affairs. How active are we going to be in demanding responsibility from Iran in insisting that Russia not invade its neighbors just because it wants to? Or saying to Taiwan, saying to China that Taiwan is a separate entity and you cannot take it over. Israel, on the specifics, was a victim of what happened on October seventh, and what's happening in Gaza is a tragedy. No matter where you stand on the issue, but this is all being driven by Iran. It's being funded by Iran. It's being coordinated by Iran, and so. The issue is much more significant. And as I keep waiting to see what's going to happen in that region, I think we're not done yet. In fact, I think we've only just started. And the Americans who prioritize Israel, and not all of them are Jewish, by the way, probably half of those who pick Israel as their number one issue are Christian and believe in a strong Israel because it's a biblical commitment. And they support Trump over Harris by two to one. But I urge you to look at the bigger picture here. What will happen 10 years from now? Will there be an agreement with Saudi Arabia? Will it be, will the Abraham Accords survive? Can there be continued peace with Jordan and Egypt? And is there a majority within the Arab world that will say enough is enough from Iran? 
This is a very important question and it's a very sophisticated question. And it's the kind of question that needs to be asked of these presidential candidates. But one of them allows himself to be interviewed too often by the press. And the other one doesn't allow the press to get at them at all. So let's hope that our, our process of electing these people. I got a text this morning. It's a longer answer than I should give you. But I got a text this morning from one of the top sportscasters in America talking about how frustrated he was that Harris is not being held more accountable by the media, that she's not willing to face the press. We'll see if that becomes an issue in this campaign, but that is a brilliant question. And the answer in the end is only about 3% of America. But among those 3%, they break for Trump two to one. Next question. Judy, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lunds. I'm calling from Appalachia, North Carolina. I so appreciate your uh, every time I hear you speak. So I'm too. I'm trying to wrap my head around the VP pick. And so I don't know if you read or heard the Wall Street Journal today about the Mountain Dew debate. So what impact do you think that Waltz and um, and Vance are trying to sort of a competition here about the rural vote? trying to uh, use the metaphoric use of Mountain Dew. Um, it, do it doesn't seem to make sense in terms of her pick. I, I Her pick makes sense in terms that he's a great campaigner and he's going to add, he's going to bring about, there's more joy on the Democratic side than the Republican side. There's more positivity on the Democratic side. Sure, they've got their criticisms of Trump and they're sharp and they're direct, but, but there's less of what they don't want and more of what they do want on the Democratic side than on the Republican side. And Vance's comments from several years ago, and I realize as I'm repeat as I'm answering your question, and for the last half hour, I realize that I probably sound like I'm pro-Harris. And I want to emphasize, I'm trying to give you the straight answer. In the end, voters tend to vote for the more optimistic candidate. In the end, voters tend to choose the candidate that gives them a vision of the future. And those would be Harris. Her challenge is the record of Biden-Harris on inflation is not good. And voters don't look at it as a single year where inflation's come down over the last year. They look at the last four years compared to Donald Trump. A record on immigration is not good. They don't look at what's happening right now. They look at the last four years. And Trump's advantage is on his administration's perceptions versus Harris. But the reason why she chose Waltz is that he is a happy warrior and that he appeals to the same people that J.D. Vance appeals to. And he hasn't made statements about calling women without children cat women. Um, it's not helpful. And the thing I'd say to you, and I know that you all are going back and forth and who you're going to support on an individual basis, is that these insults do grab people's attention, but they don't necessarily grab their votes. And in the debate between Waltz and Vance, Vance will be held accountable for some of the stuff that he said in the past. And it just comes across as me. And Waltz will be held accountable for some of the things that he said in the past. And it'll come across as extreme. In fact, there's my soundbite. Thank you. You just helped me find the soundbite for this entire mean versus extreme. Which will the public vote for? But in the end, the vice presidential, vice presidential pick will have very little impact on the race overall. Next question. Um, Hap Stein. Hap. Yes, uh, Dr. Lunch, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. My question is, is if Harris wins, what are the chances of the Republicans regaining control of the Senate? And conversely, if uh, Trump wins, what's the, what are the chances of the uh, Democrats holding either the House or the uh, control of the House or the Senate? There is split ticket voting for Senate races because the public does get to know who they are. There's much less so in House races that will be much more dependent upon what happens at the presidential race. If Harris beats Trump, it means that she's been successful in bringing out to the to the polls 
young women who had no interest in a Trump-Biden ticket. It also probably means that he's united the African-American vote, which Trump is getting a significant, a meaningful, measurable percentage of young African-American men. I think the House will flip to the Democrats if Harris wins and will remain Republican if Trump wins. On the Senate side, there are three states that I'm watching, four states. Montana, because John Tester is such a good candidate and has been willing to break with the Democrats in the past, even though Trump's going to win that state overwhelmingly. And then the states of Nevada, Ohio, and Michigan. All three states, the Democrats have the advantage right now, but the advantage is in single digits and it's incredibly tight, maybe five points. Harris winning suggests that the Democrats participated and suggests that they will hold the Congress. Trump winning suggests that he was able to break Harris's hold and that he will have turned out his votes as he always is, has been able to do, both in 2016 and 2020. Um, but you can't call it now because we don't know if and when that debate's going to be or the two debates. And we don't know whether Donald Trump has the self-control to focus on the record rather than make the ad hominem attacks that he's known for over the last seven years. It's Mark Mabry from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm curious, uh, are there any paths to getting the candidates uh, to move away from personal insults to focus on issues that we all care about, like national security, economics, national debt, health care, and so on? Like, do we have to more strongly advocate for debates, platform documents, press interviews, town halls? What, what, what are the mechanisms that we could move away or toward uh, contentful, meaningful information for- Mark, for Mark, do you think that if you went up to Donald Trump and asked him that question and begged him, do you think that your appeal from Boston, Massachusetts would be accepted? Uh, you, you you assume he's he assume, he hears something from Boston, Massachusetts. Okay, so you're not even going <laughs> to so get heard. I challenge your presumption, uh, but yes, you know the answer Mark, to the question. Yes, and the answer is no, and we're going to go on because there's nothing I can add to it. Donald Trump's going to be Donald Trump, and so, that makes so, the reason why he loses. Next question, please. All right, I'm depressed. <laughs> uh, and Harry. I'm and Mark, I'm sorry, but that's the hard truth. Harriet, go ahead. Harriet. Harriet, we, there we go. Uh, you're on mute, Harriet. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, early on when this first started, you said that Trump wins on inflation and immigration and that the Democrats had the right tactic but the wrong strategy, but you never outlined what the strategy should be. I'm from New York. If I'm, if I'm a Democrat, I am focused on, can we do better? To me, that's something that's so inherent in an American culture. How can we improve, or is this the best we can do? You actually recognize that there's some good that happened be between 2017 and 2021, which Harris is never going to do but you recognize that some things actually were good. Black un unemployment was at record lows. Hispanic unemployment at record lows. And then you say, but we've become so divided. There was a cost to this, that there's a way to keep a good economy, to keep a strong country and not tear each other to shreds. Do you want every day to see the latest insult, the latest meanness, or can we be a kinder, gentler country? So I would, I if I'm a Democrat, I'm going to focus on what I'm going to focus on what Trump has said. And by the way, his big strategy during the debate was to say, "I never said that." But the answer is, the truth is, he did. All the things that Biden would say, Trump said, he did. But you have to be able to show it. In fact, I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the Harris strategy. I would invite the news media to a debate. If Donald Trump says you're not going to show up on September 10th, you bring Trump virtual 
to, to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You put them up on the screen, a screen that's three times bigger than life, five times bigger than life, and you play his greatest hits. Then you push pause, and then you respond to him. All the insults, play them. And say, Mr. Trump, this is your words. And here's how I respond. The media would eat it up. By the way, this is such a effing good idea that I should have offered this to, to CNN. I can't believe I just gave it away right here for nothing. But I would create the first, and I, in fact, I make that announcement, that we're going to have the first virtual debate ever. Only I, Kamala Harris, are, I'm showing up. And whether Donald Trump is there in person or his likeness, we're going to do it anyway. That That's... Um, Geez, even I know that's kind of smart. Okay, <laughs> next, next question. How decisive must the results be to avoid a challenge or violence after the election? And I have a simple answer, which is I believe that there will be a challenge no matter what happens with the results. Joe Biden beat Donald Trump by 4.5% in 2020. That's a pretty decisive popular vote. He beat Trump got more than 300 electoral votes. He did better than than uh, than uh, Barack Obama over Mitt Romney. And Trump still said the election was stolen. So we have to assume that that's going to happen. But we also have to educate the public about how votes are counted, educate them that votes aren't dumped, and educate them that sometimes... It takes a day or two or three days, and it doesn't mean that votes are being stolen. And my hostility towards Pennsylvania, and yes, it is part of their law, is that they know the damage that they caused in 2020. And the, and the fact is that they didn't change the rules and their laws since then. And that's simply atrocious. And it happens in other states as well. So Mel, I'm very pessimistic about what's going to happen and I'm depending on the media. I'm going to go for a walk. To present this in the future so that people know what to look for and they know the truth. In terms of uh, the selection of uh, your walls to be the VP, will that make it more difficult uh, <clears throat> to move to the center and appeal to the uh, 5 or 10% of the moderate votes that are undecided? And is that really a moot question? Because all Trump seems to be doing these days is complaining and incapable of uh, making the case. Gary, that's very smart. That's a very smart question. It's a very accurate question. Harris would have to move to the center if Trump moved to the center, but Trump is only speaking to his base because he only knows his base. There are plenty of examples. And by the way, Ryan, I can still do two more. Okay. Gary, an election has consequences. Campaigns have consequences. And what Trump does in a vacuum doesn't matter. It's what he does vis-a-vis -vis Harris and vice versa. Harris does not need to move to the center because Trump has stayed on the right. He stayed with his people. He uses the same attack lines. He uses the same statements. Donald Trump is campaigning the exact same way now that he was. He just changed the names, changed the attributes, but it's no different. And my challenge to him, what I would say to him is, sir, this campaign is still yours to lose because your administration is still seen as better than Joe Biden's. But the reason why you're now actually losing is because of you, sir, your attributes, how you carry yourself and the public's desire to get away from that. If he doesn't change his tune, she doesn't need to move because he's only talking to people who already agree with him. And that is a surefire way, way to lose this election. Great question. Let's add two more here. Okay, Steve, over to you. Thanks, Ryan, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lutz. Uh, so my I'm from Erie, Colorado, suburb of Denver. My question is about voter turnout. If such a large percentage of the electorate is dissatisfied with both candidates, 
Has there been any uh, polling or studies done on what percentage of all the eligible voters in the U.S. will actually cast a ballot? And of those that do, of the eligible voters that do cast a ballot, what percentage just won't vote for either presidential candidate, but they'll vote down ballot? Uh, that was the case, particularly when Biden was the Democratic nominee. And I actually thought that the voter turnout was going to be significantly less than what it was in 2020 because people were just so disappointed in having to make the same choice now that they had to make, make in 2020. With Harris coming in, younger women are active, younger black men are active. It's it's completely scrambled the turnout equation. And arguably we're gonna have a very high turnout now because Trump voters have always wanted to back their guy. And now you Democrats have someone they can back that they feel comfortable with, that they're excited about. In terms of voting for a third party candidate, I still think that there is a demand for an alternative to these two candidates, but it is not as great as what it was when it was Biden versus Trump. And in the end, we're gonna have this third party I don't know if it's going to be four years from now or 12 years from now, but with every passing year, the loyalty to the Democratic Party and to the Republican Party drops, and the more people want to have a third option. So that's going to continue to increase. But whether that leads to an actual third party and a candidate running, your bet's as good as mine. And uh, Dave, to close us up, Dave, go ahead. Dave, you're on mute. Yes, uh, sorry. Um, question is, uh, there's quite a difference in the foreign policy experience of Donald Trump and, and uh, Kamala Harris, um, and quite a difference in the performance. In light of that, do you think that foreign policy and national security is going to become a more salient issue as people think about uh, likely outcomes with the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians, and, um, you know, the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Israel. When we were polling, so I'm not going to answer the policy question, but you're correct that it will become more important. And in fact, arguably, they could do a debate just on foreign policy because we've got four significant foreign policy crises, China, Russia, uh, Iran, and the border. That said, it's foreign policy comes to the forefront when there's a terrorist attack <clears throat> or comes to the forefront when there's a war going on that America is directly involved in. And when that doesn't happen, foreign policy is less important. Before... Russia invaded Ukraine. Foreign policy had fallen to 2% as being the most important issue facing the country. Right after that invasion, it had grown up to 5%. When Hamas invaded Israel, at that point, it was a 3% issue. Then it, it, it once again went up to 5% out of fear that this was going to provoke a conflict with Iran. What goes on in the Middle East will determine how salient the issue is. And I believe that foreign policy would be Trump's advantage with one exception. Americans don't want to abandon NATO. Americans do not want to pull out. And every time he talks about it, he thinks that he's making the case for forcing NATO to pay their fair share. But what he's doing is scaring Americans that actually we might send our allies adrift. And it's a great way to close this because I'm a language guy. I listen to the words and phrases that people communicate, in this case, in your questions, and in most cases, in what the American public think and feel. And why I'm so glad to be able to share this conversation with Americans, we're gonna edit it down to something briefer, is that I want them to see that it is possible to have discussions like this where you put Democrats and Republicans on the same call and they don't have to fight. 
that you put conservatives and liberals on the same call and they can still agree on some on the fundamentals, even if they disagree on the solutions. And that all these issues that even if they're not top burner, such as foreign policy, that they still matter. So that we're hearing from the public and we're recognizing what matters to them. We're respecting their voice, which is so important. We are respecting it and listening to it and hearing it and internalizing it and not shouting at them back, but seeking to make the differences and make the decisions that are so necessary. I, I so believe in this organization, even if it isn't running, running a candidate, because you bring people together in conversations that aren't happening anywhere else but on Zoom calls like this. And I want the world to see it. I want the world to know that there is hope. I teach at West Point right now, and my cadets think I'm way too negative. After this discussion, I'm not negative anymore. Because after this discussion with Americans like you, seeking answers, seeking solutions, and seeking the truth, that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So, so from my heart to yours. Thank you for being so insightful and thank you for being so direct. And I hope I've shown you that I respect and appreciate you as much as, as what you have said, the kindness you've shown me. This is what America should be. Ryan? Uh, Frank, that's a great closing thought. Thank you for taking so much time with us today. Thank all of you um, who are listening for your, for your amazing questions. Um, this has been another edition of No Labels Talks. Uh, be, be on the lookout for this, which will be turning into a podcast. You can listen to it in its entirety. Until then, look forward to seeing everybody next week.